Hello and welcome to Empowered Learning. This is the second video in the video series for convolution. And so this video, we will go over how to use convolution in conjunction with the Laplace transform uh, to solve ordinary differential equations. So I'm going to start off with uh, a first order an initial value problem that we looked at in video number one to kind of round off why is it that we are uh, going to be using convolution here okay so we want to recall that we had this particular first order uh, linear ordinary differential equation with this initial value condition here and notice that uh, what we have proposed in that first video is that if we took the Laplace transform of both sides of this equation here and uh, we said that let uh, Laplace transform of y equal to the product of these two Laplace transforms here, then that would end up equaling uh, the product of uh, x of t and h of t for the actual solution. But we saw that this didn't work. Okay, And so uh, it turns out that if we would have done uh, the convolution of these two functions, that would have worked. And so I'm going to demonstrate that here in just a second. Now, um, one thing that I want to note before we actually get into doing the convolution of t squared and e raised to the 5t, um, notice that I could actually solve the same equation um, by doing first order linear methods here. And I know, uh, depending upon who you are and how you solve these equations here, um, you may find the integrating factor and multiply both sides by it and then, you know, do some other trickery to get, get the answer. Um, I know the way that I do it is we know that everything comes out to this formula. So I just always use that formula where I know what my, my H and my R is going to be, where H is the integral of PDX and R it's just going to be whatever function this is on the right side of the um, first order differential equation. So uh, we could either do it that way or we could uh, solve it by method of undetermined coefficients if we want. Um, we normally don't do it that way because we normally reserve a method of undetermined coefficients for second order and higher, but uh, we could actually do it that way. Either way, um, you'll know that if you solve it using one of these two methods here, uh, this is what our solution would be uh, to our ordinary differential equation here with the initial condition that y of zero is equal to zero. Okay, So I'm saying all this to say that this is what we're expecting to get if we convolve our two functions t squared and e raised to the 5t. So if we get the same answer here, then we know it's going to work. So if we start the process of convolving um, these two functions here, then of course, uh, we go ahead and do the definition of what convolution is. Um, we let the e raised to the 5t function be the one where we do the uh, horizontal shift and reflection across the uh, y axis, because uh, this is one that's easy to break up. And since x is the variable that's tied to the integral, we know that anything with t in it is going to be a constant. So e raised to the 5t comes out. And then, of course, um, at this point, we know that we can do integration by parts. Um, if we let u equal x squared and dv equal e raised to the negative 5x dx. So doing uh, tabular integration by parts to make it nice and quick, uh, we see that uh, we end up having this result whenever we do that, just um, diagonally go across, multiply, add, subtract, add. And so since we stop here at zero, we know we can stop there. So um, the integral of e raised to 5t of uh, the integration by parts integral that we're trying to find is just e raised to 5t of all this business that we said here. Evaluate it from um, zero to t. So we plug in t everywhere where we see x to start off with. We get these first three terms and then do the same thing with zero. And of course, the only term that is non-zero is the last one because e raised to the zero is going to be one and one times two over 125 is just going to be two over 125. So at that point, 
we go ahead and we multiply e raised to the 5t to all three terms here. And we see that e raised to the 5t times e raised to the minus 5t is just going to be 1 for all of these. And we see that uh, the result that we get here is the same result that we got uh, before whenever we solved it, let's say, by uh, first order linear methods or by method of undetermined coefficients. So we know that convolving these two functions together actually works um, to solve, uh, to get the actual solution to the uh, first order ordinary differential equation that we were checking out. Okay. So uh, we see from this example and noting that uh, t squared and e raised to the 5t functions came from doing the inverse Laplace transform of 2 divided by s cubed and 1 divided by s minus 5 respectively. Okay, And uh, if you don't remember that, so if you remember we uh, had this situation here where the Laplace transform of that equation that we were dealing with was essentially this. And of course, we just took the inverse Laplace transform of each factor there, okay? And so uh, from that, we're, we make the following observations. And so um, I'm actually gonna state all these observations in two major theorems. So uh, this first theorem is just on us using convolution um, to solve ordinary differential equations in general. So we have two functions, f and g, and we were saying let them be functions such that they satisfy uh, the two criteria uh, that's stated below. Now, um, first criteria is that both of these functions are either continuous or at least piecewise continuous. The second one is that if I was to take um, either one of these functions, multiply times e raised to the minus st, and then take the limit of it um, as t approaches infinity, I would get zero in either case. Uh, this is a very fancy way of saying that um, f of t and g of t are, are both of order, and I'm calling it uh, exponential order, s of k, where s of k is always going to be a number that is uh, smaller than uh, whatever this S is here, okay? Now, the fact that these two are functions along with these other two conditions here, we could simply just lump that together and say, um, if we're considering two functions that are Laplace transformable, okay? And I say that because if you um, watch the videos that I did on Laplace transform, we went into detail on talking about uh, the fact that in order for a function to be um, Laplace transformable, um, we needed to have um, a function that was well-defined. And by definition, if we have a function, it is well-defined, um, at least with the type of functions that we'll be dealing with. And it also meets these other conditions of the function either has to be continuous or piecewise continuous, and that uh, both functions are of exponential order. So those are the three things that have to be in place for a function to be Laplace transformable. And this theorem is just basically stating that, okay? So we can reword this and say, if both f and g are Laplace transformable type functions, then it follows that if I do the Laplace transform of the convolution of two functions, that's going to be the same as me taking the Laplace transform of each one of those functions and multiplying them together uh, with regular multiplication that we're used to seeing, okay? And vice versa is also true. So if I was to have this situation here and I wanted to figure out what's going to be um, the inverse Laplace, well, let's let's figure out what um, F convolved G is going to be. Then what I would have to do is take the inverse Laplace transform of each of these and then convolve them together. And that is what, um, what F convolved G or or the convolution of f and g would be. Okay? So the third thing in this theorem is really just restating the second thing in this theorem, but um, stating it in a way to set us up for theorem number two that we're going to see here in just a second.
So all I'm saying here is let's consider these three functions again. And uh, let's say they're all Laplace transformable again. Um, let's also note that big Y, big X, and big H are going to be the corresponding Laplace transforms for these three functions. Um, then we can express the Laplace transform of Y as the product of Laplace transform of X and H. And so uh, if we can do that, then we know that um, it also follows that the inverse Laplace transform of this is going to be the inverse Laplace transform of the convolution of both of these. Okay. And so, um, again, just same thing that we kind of stated up here, but we're just stating it in a different way. And I'm using um, notation that I'm going to use in theorem uh, number two or, or something similar to that um, so that we can get that point across. All right, so uh, theorem number two, uh, which is a direct application of making this discovery, um, which is basically Duhamel's uh, principle. And so what Duhamel principle basically communicates to us is that if we are trying to solve a an nth order linear uh, ordinary differential equation, so um, if, and that's basically what this is, nth order linear ordinary differential equation where all of our const, uh, our coefficients here are constants. And on top of that, if we had a situation where if it was initial value problem, all of the initial conditions equaled zero. So we, if we have that situation um, in place, in addition to that, if we know that uh, the Laplace transform of f is little f is going to be big f then and that's of course for here so it doesn't matter whether this nth order linear equation is going to be uh, homogeneous or non-homogeneous if we have all that in place then we know that we could find what our solution is by just doing the convolution uh, convolution of uh, these two functions h and f, okay, where we define um, h, and this will be h of x here. Uh, this will be the inverse Laplace transform of big H of s, and what big what h of s is going to be here is just one over um, essentially what all the terms of our um, nth order linear ODE is going to be. Okay? So uh, we'll actually see this in practice, but um, basically what we're saying um, is this, and I'll kind of use the uh, example that we had here to, to kind of make my point. So if you remember, we had Y of S is two over this, and that was one over S minus five. And we know that this actually came from this situation here, okay? So uh, when we took the Laplace transform of that example that we were talking about, uh, we actually had to divide both sides by S minus five. Now what this is here is essentially the S minus five, okay? And so, um, of course, whatever this function is, uh, this is going to be the f that we're that we're talking about here. Okay, so what Duhamel's principle is basically saying: if we have a situation where we have an nth order um, linear ODE, regardless of whether it's um, homogeneous or not, whatever this uh, force function is going to be and I'll call it that, whatever this force function is going to be, if we just take the Laplace transform of that and then do one over whatever all of this right side here would be, but in, pl in place of Y, you would put S raised to the you know little N for that, and you would do one over all of that, uh, we would have this situation here, 
And of course, if I was to take the inverse Laplace transform of this, inverse Laplace transform of this, and convolute them together, then I would get my solution to my um, ordinary differential equation. Okay, And this function h of x here that, that I'm mentioning, um, this is actually known as the impulse response, or uh, we call the weighted response. So um, essentially, if we were modeling some system, um, if we had a very short burst of energy, um, how the system would respond to it would be the same way um, that h of x would be. Okay, And I'm, I'm looking here, and since I have this in terms of t, um, I really probably should have this in terms of t here. Uh, since this is the same thing as T, but yeah. But the, the point here is that um, we want to know if we have a situation where we can just kind of quickly get to uh, the answer to start com convolving things, um, what is that going to look like? Okay, and this gives us a, a very uh, general standard way to be able to solve uh, linear ODEs. Uh, in particular, linear ODEs that have constant coefficients. All right, so before we actually get into examples, I'm going to run through a few uh, tips, tricks, and observations about uh, Dudamel's principle that uh, we want to sort of note. Uh, we're actually going to see some of these things in the examples that we do, but I want to just kind of run through them now, and then I'll refer back to them as need be once we see them in the examples. So the first observation is one that I've actually mentioned before, and that is that since we know um, in this case that H convolved with F is the same as F convolved with H, we could use either this form or this form of um, doing the convolution on these two functions, really doesn't matter. Um, however, uh, we wanna use whichever one of these forms here that is going to make life easiest for us whenever uh, we're doing it. So for instance, um, if my H function was, um, you know, sine of X and my F function was E raised to the two X, then of course I want to choose this version. Uh, sorry. Uh, I want to choose this version here, the first version, uh, to be able to do the convolution of that because I know if I replace X here with t minus x, that's a whole lot easier to deal with than if I come over here uh, and use this one and replace um, sine of x with sine of t minus x, okay? Because then I have to use the you know addition formula for sine and you know that gets a little bit more complicated than what we want to do. All right, so next thing is note that if we were uh, to say that y of t is going to be the convolution of h and f, then both y and h will need to be Laplace transformable for this to work, but f doesn't necessarily have to be Laplace transformable, okay? So if we write it in this form, this needs to be Laplace transformable, that needs to be Laplace transformable, f does not. So whichever one is over here, or put another way, if I, if I go back, to what we were talking about here, whichever function that we are proposing that we do the horizontal shift and reflection about the, the y axis to is the one that doesn't necessarily have to be Laplace transform. Okay. So if we switch the way that we do the convolution, let's say now we want to do um, f convolve with h, um, since we know that h convolved with f is the same thing as f convolved with h, then in this case, these two functions, y and f, need to be Laplace transformable, but h does not have to be, okay? Now, the reason for that um, is tied to this whole thing of doing a horizontal shift and reflection across the um, y-axis here. Now, uh, to, not to try to get too deep, but uh, the reason why this is true is because we can show that um, if we're considering uh, the situation where we're looking at h convolve f, which is going to be 
uh, this situation here. So if we could define um, our function f sub big T, and so this is going to be kind of like a, um, almost like a step function, but we're saying that, hey, um, at time at time t, it's going to switch from acting like one thing to another, okay? So whatever that is. So it's saying as long as little t is smaller than this big T, it's going to act like the function f of x, or in this case, f of t, um, and it's going to be zero afterwards. So I'm going to try to demonstrate what that looks like in general so that you can kind of get an idea of why um, this function here, it really doesn't matter if it's Laplace transformable or not. All right, so I'm just going to just draw something random here. Let's say this is my value t, and this will be f of t here, and this uh, will be t here. And so let's say my function looks something like this. So I'm just going to try to make life a little simple here. I'll just make this one, and let's say it kind of does like this. Okay. And let's say here, I have an open circle there. And then for values that are T and higher, I'm just going to do open circle and it's going to be like this. And again, this will be my function F of T right here. And I'm going to switch that and I'm just going to call this the Y axis. y is equal to f of t. So here, uh, this is basically a description of what this is talking about. And we just have some random function uh, f of t here. So what this is saying is that uh, we could show that if f of so uh, big T could be defined this way, which I've drawn a picture of that, where well, we assume that t is approaching infinity um, because if we can express our function this way then when we convolve h and f together we know that it's going to be a well-defined function and it's going to satisfy uh, the initial value problem for the ordinary difference equation um, regardless of if this is going to be continuous function or a piecewise continuous function okay so let me kind of show you what's going on here. Now notice that um, we're assuming that T is approaching infinity. So um, and let me go ahead and darken this because this should be like that. So let's say this is equal to infinity, right? So the main thing here is that when it, whenever we convolve um, H and F, remember F is the one that has this thing going on with it. Right. And if we rewrite that again, this looks something like this. OK. And so what we've actually done is we've taken this function that that we know of. And when we rewrite it like this, we have basically say that F of um, now, because we're looking in terms of X and not necessarily uh, T, we're saying that F of X is going to be a function that is horizontally shifted to the right. And by applying the negative inside of there, it's going to be reflected across the X axis. OK, so what this is. Um, if we wrote it in terms of f of x, is going to look something like this. So we would have this. This kind of goes like that. Open circle, close circle here. This would go in this direction. And the t would be in this direction. And of course, this would be going towards negative infinity. So whenever we do... Uh, this is the same thing as that. What we're saying here is the same thing as if I was looking at uh, my function f of x, but what I did to it is I did a horizontal shift 
um, F of X, but I did a horizontal shift to the left um, T units and then flip it over the, or reflect it across the Y axis. So I'll have something that looks like this, the equivalent of it, when I do these two is what this is on the other side, okay? Now, the reason why it, it really doesn't matter is that, of course, on this side, it's still going to be a piecewise continuous, okay? So in other words, if I'm looking at this as T approaches positive infinity, this is still a piecewise continuous function, so I'm good. If I look at it in this sense, which is really what's happening um, whenever I do this um, double transformation here, notice that the Laplace transform is only valid from zero to infinity, okay? So here I'm actually considering values when I have it into this form from zero on down to negative infinity. And notice that the Laplace transform um, isn't valid for those values of T. And so because of that, um, the, the function F in terms of what has to happen for the integral to work and all that is immaterial, okay? Because we're not even considering that in the first place. And on top of that, it's going to be written in a different variable, okay? So um, this integral here uh, would kind of look at this as um, some constant function. It would just get factored out. So it was like, whatever it is, it'll be out, and then you'll just deal with the integral of the rest of it, okay? And so effectively, even though that's not exactly what's happening, but effectively, that's what's going on. And that is the reason why um, we say that whenever we convolve H and F, whatever this function is doesn't necessarily have to be Laplace transformable for Duhamel's principle to work, okay? And so this sort of thing happens specifically whenever we have all those conditions that are in place, meaning that we have a first order uh, linear ODE. It's not, not first order, but an nth order linear ODE where all of the coefficients are constants and all of our initial conditions equal zero. If we have that situation, then of course, when we do this whole thing of uh, taking the function and flipping it over, um, it's going to be this situation here. Okay. So um, in a nutshell, that is why um, it really doesn't matter um, if it's, you know, whatever function is here doesn't have to be Laplace transform. All right. So next thing is if we consider um, our ordinary differential equation in equation star in theorem two, that's basically the one that says that we have an nth order um, linear equation, whether it's homogeneous or not, where all of the const, uh, coefficients are constants. Um, but we have a situation where all of the, uh, where there's at least one initial condition that is not equal to zero. So that let's say if we have something like um, y of zero is equal to two, but then all the rest of them um, end up being zero. Uh, up to n minus one rather. So I'll write that up to n minus one, all these up to that. So we got one that isn't, others are. If we have that situation here, then how we would actually find uh, the solution to the ordinary differential equation is we would first find the solution that is obtained by Duhamel's principle with all of the zero initial conditions, okay? So in other words, what we would do is we would actually solve um, this particular equation where we assume that all the initial conditions are zero, um, even though if it isn't, we're just gonna assume that it is, and then we just solve it that way. And then that solution will be added to the solution where if we look at this equation again, but if our f of t is equal to zero, we we force it to be that. So we're looking here. Uh, we say whatever it is, we just change all the initial conditions to where they all equal zero. Here we say uh, whatever f of t is, if it's not already zero, make it zero. So we're making it a homogeneous um, nth order linear equation. And then after that, we solve this with the desired um, initial conditions. So the ones that we originally had in the problem. 
And if we add both of these uh, so solutions together, then we will get what the actual solution of this would be. Okay. And so um, in a crude way, not exact way, but in a crude way, um, you could kind of think of this as the homogeneous solution and the particular solution. Um, that's not, you know, exactly correct, but um, it's kind of the same thing where uh, we're getting our solution from two different phenomena as it's happening. Okay. All right. So now that we've gone over those points, um, we're actually going to start looking at some of these um, examples that we did in the Laplace transform videos. And so I'm, I'm going to go through three of them because uh, these three would be the easiest three to, to kind of do without going too deep. All right. So with our first example, uh, we want to solve the following initial value um, ordinary differential equation problem by convolution. And so whenever we did the uh, Laplace transform uh, videos, uh, we saw that this first order um, linear um, non-homogeneous equation um, with this initial condition, the Laplace transform for it was this e raised to the negative 4s, all that divided by the product of s and s minus 5. And so we saw that our solution to this was uh, this particular result here where we define our step sub 4 as being 0 for values of t that are less than 4 but 1 for values of t that are greater than or equal to 4. So I'm stating all this because we know this is the answer that we should get. Okay. And so what we're going to do is verify that we get this same answer by using convolution. So we start off by saying that, hey, uh, since I know that taking the Laplace transform of our ODE yields uh, this particular result here, um, we want to break this up as x raised to the s times h raised to the s where we're going to let our x raised to the s be the e raised to the minus 4s over s, and then the h of s as 1 over s minus 5. And so if you're wondering, well, how do I know which one to let uh, what be what? Um, if we go back to Duhamel's principle, remember that um, we always want to do the inverse Laplace transform of h of s, where in this case, um, H of S is always going to be one over. And then of course, what's down here at the bottom is actually the, the, uh, nth order linear, um, ODE in terms of S instead of in terms of Y. So it's always going to be one over, um, whatever that would look like. So once we have that, then it's just a matter of figuring out what's going to be the inverse Laplace transform of both big X and big H. And so here we state that uh, we expect that our solution Y of T to be the convolution of the inverse Laplace transform of big X and big H. And so um, in doing that, we see that here, we know that the inverse Laplace transform of that is going to be the step sub 4. And if we go to uh, Laplace transform table, we could see that. So if we look here, we see that E raised to the negative alpha uh, S. And of course, our alpha in this case would be 4, uh, would go right along with this step uh, alpha of t or step of t minus alpha. So we see uh, this fits that. And of course, the inverse Laplace transform of one over s minus five, we go to the table here, um, one over s minus alpha. So our alpha is five in this case, be e raised to the five t. So once we get that, then it's just a matter of us actually um, writing this out since we know that this could be defined as a piecewise function because the step sub four of t is a piecewise function, then we have to convolve 
e raised to the 5t with both 0 and 1. Um, in the case of 0, we saw from our properties that 0 convolved with any function gives us 0. So we have the situation here. And we see that 1 convolved with any function is just going to be um, the integral of the other function from uh, 0 to whatever t is. And so in this case, since we have a shift in, um, in t for four units, um, we actually are going to start at t minus four instead of just t, okay? So in other words, uh, this, this integral can't really activate for values um, beyond t equals zero unless it's past four, okay? And so uh, once we do that, then, of course, uh, we just need to figure out what this particular integral is here. And then once we have that, we pretty much have our answer. So we uh, integrate from 0 to uh, t minus 4 of e raised to the 5x. Um, of course, uh, in doing this, it's just going to be substitution rule, um, divide by 5, evaluate. Everywhere we see x, we put in t minus 4, minus same thing, put in 0, get our answer here. And just note here that one uh, can be written in terms of uh, step sub four or step of t minus four uh, because of the fact that this particular result will not activate unless t is uh, greater than or equal to four. Okay. And so we see that uh, from that, we get our final answer here. And we see that. Uh, y is the same as steps of 4 convolved with e raised to 5t. And we see once we do that, we indeed get this answer here. And just for clarity, we make sure that steps of 4 is defined this way. Okay. Now, um, one other thing I do want to say, uh, just in case you may not have caught this, is that uh, I know normally... Um, at this stage here, if we're convolving things, we would do it from a zero to T. So we would do this, but I told you that we're going to do it as T minus four. And so part of the reason for that, um, if we look at it mathematically here, if I was to actually go and let's say plug in uh, a number here that's smaller than four, like two, then I would have integral from zero to a negative two. And of course, um, for what we're trying to do, I would have to flip the integral sign, well, um, switch the uh, limits of integration and multiply by a negative. And we know that, that that means that we're going in the opposite direction. We really don't want to do that, okay? So we only want this, um, the limits of integration here to be activated for values uh, t that are zero and higher. So that means the smallest value I could possibly put in for t is four, okay? And so if I put in four here, then that would give me the integral from zero to zero. And of course we know um, any integral um, with the limit of integration from zero to zero is just going to be zero itself. So it's really not gonna to contribute to anything. And so, um, that's why we can start there, but any value after that that's larger than that, um, let's say zero to five, then of course now we actually got something that we can work with, okay? So I wanna make sure that that was clear before um, I went ahead and moved on to the next example. All right, so our next example, same kind of thing. We have a first order um, linear equation, the initial value uh, condition here. Notice that the initial value uh, is not equal to zero. And so since it's not equal to zero, what this means is, is we're going to have to go back and use um, that observation from saying, hey, if, if we have a situation where we don't have all zero initial conditions, then we're going to have to do the combination of uh, taking the finding the solution to our ODE using Duhamel's principle and force all the initial conditions to be zero. And then we find out what the solution is going to be to the corresponding homogeneous equation uh, 
uh, for our situation. So in other words, we'd have to make the zero um, for that second part and basically solve this equation with zero, but have this initial condition in there and take those two solutions and add them together. And that is how we would actually get um, the actual solution for y of t for this problem. And uh, of course, that solution would be uh, 10 over 7 minus 31 over 7 e raised to the negative 7 t. And so we're going to show that by doing the process that I just described, uh, that we're going to be able to get the same answer here. Okay. All right. So let's uh, take care of first things first. Um, we're going to apply uh, Duhamel's principle um, by basically saying, let's solve this equation as is, but force this initial condition to be zero. So that's how we're going to basically start it off. All right. So um, here I'm noting that we know that our uh, Laplace transform of the solution is in two terms. Okay. And so what we're going to see is that in, the, in doing this is that this is the actual part that comes from doing Duhamel's principle um, with the forced initial conditions. And this part is actually the part where we do the homogeneous solution with the desired initial conditions. Okay. Whereas here we got zero IVPs. And so we're going to see that actually ends up being that. Um, So what I'm doing here to make this clear, I'm going to call y sub d the solution by doing Duhamel's principle with this forced initial condition and y sub h i, meaning um, we're going to do homogeneous solution with actual initial conditions. Uh, that's what the h i means. Uh, we're going to do that uh, to find the other solution. So I'm going to solve this equation. And of course, uh, for this one here, I'll just rewrite it. And I think, yeah, we had a 10 there. So we're gonna solve this equation first, and then we're gonna solve this initial value equation second. And we're gonna add both of those up for whatever we get for Y for both of those, and that will be the actual solution. So to find our y sub d by using the Laplace transform, um, we kind of do the same thing that we did whenever we were doing the Laplace transform on this problem in the Laplace transform videos. So I just do it over here. So I take the Laplace tr transform of uh, y prime, Laplace transform of 7y, and you see uh, what that is, and Laplace transform of 10, which is the same as saying a Laplace transform of 10 times Sorry, the Laplace transform of 1 times 10, which is 10 over s. And so uh, from there, uh, since our initial condition here, we're forcing it to be uh, 0 in this case, then we essentially have this situation here where I can factor out big Y of s out of both terms. And notice that once I divide both sides by s plus 7, I have this situation here, and we're going to let this be our h of s, this be our x of s, okay? So now um, we know that since we have our Laplace transform of the solution for this portion of it written that way, we know that if we just find the inverse Laplace transform of both x of s and h of s and convolve them together, that would be um, the actual solution that we should get for this portion of our total solution. So uh, we take the inverse Laplace transform of, of 10 over s, which is just 10, inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s plus 7, which is e raised to the negative 7t, and we just convolve these two things together. And of course, uh, we have a definition of convolution here where z is going to be my variable of integration, t is the constant. Uh, we put that in, of course, the 10 and the negative, sorry, e raised to the negative 7t, 
Um, those two things are constants. Only thing that's left is e raised to the 7z matches up with that variable. And then from there, we just take the antiderivative. So we take the antiderivative, which is e raised to the 7z divided by 7. Uh, plug in t everywhere where we see z minus do the same thing, plug in 0. Have the situation here. And then, of course, from that point, um, we just simplify, do as much as we can. And we see that y sub d is just 10 over 7 minus 10 over 7 e raised to the negative 7 t. Now, one thing I want to note here is that the equation we just solved, um, it probably would have been a little bit easier um, if we would have solved it using separable techniques because it is technically a separable equation. Um, however, uh, we want to show um, how we use this in conjunction with Laplace transform. So that is why um, I'm doing nothing but Laplace transform with this. Okay. Um, in actual practice, you'll just pick whichever way is easiest for you uh, to do. If you're like um, doing this for a project or something like that um, outside of a test, and you always want to take the, the path of least resistance to, to get the solutions that you want to get to. Okay. All right. So now what we need to do to find the other part of the solution is we need to say, well, what is going to be the solution to the homogeneous corresponding homogeneous equation but with the initial condition that i originally wanted okay so um, for this one um, what i decide to do here um, didn't necessarily have to do this but what i just decided to do is um, i use first order linear to to be able to uh, do this uh, note that I can do this by Laplace transform again, um, but I just chose not to do it. So I just did the whole thing about solving first order linear, um, and I'm going to assume that you know how to do that um, if you're at this point. So we just do that. We get our corresponding results here for H and R, and then we substitute all that in, and the result that we get is this once we're done. So um, since A and C are both constants here, we can combine that into one big constant and we'll just call that a case of one. And here we could just rewrite this as homogeneous solution is going to be a case of one E raised to negative seven T. So in general here, um, if we apply our initial condition to this result, uh, we just see that when x, sorry, when uh, t is 0, our y value is negative 3. So our result here is that k1 is 3. And so this ends up being what our y of hi is. And so now we just combine the two solutions together. So our y sub d was the solution here, y sub hi the solution here and then we just basically combine like terms and we see that we get the same thing that we got originally now if we wanted to solve that same part the uh, y sub h i if we wanted to do it um, using the plus transform here then now i'm going to go ahead and do it that way right quick so you can see what that looks like. So if I took the Laplace transform of both sides here, then this first term, this would be S Y of S minus Y of zero plus seven times big Y of S and the Laplace transform of zero is itself just zero. Um, we see here that minus well, let's, yeah, minus y of zero here. Um, so be a minus three. So subtract the negative is the same as addition. And of course, uh, from here, what we would have is just S, oops, 
So it'd be S plus seven. I was trying to write that, but that didn't come out right. <laughs> Let's get rid of that. So this would be S plus seven, all that times Y of S. And then of course over here, uh, you would have minus three. And then your Y of S would just be negative three over S plus seven. And if you were trying to find the inverse Laplace transform for this, then this would literally be um, negative three inverse Laplace transform of one over S plus seven. And we know from here, um, if we look at our Laplace transform tables, those along, this is the form here where our alpha is a negative seven. So that would go along with the negative seven that would be right here. And so this would end up being negative three e raised to the minus seven t. And if you notice, that's the same thing that we got down here, okay? And so um, in that case, even though I did it a different way, um, we could we could have actually done it the Laplace transform way and it probably would have took you know a little less time but I just decided to, to do it that way um, just to kind of remind you that we can actually solve some of these equations um, and doing it piece by piece some other way so all right so let's move on to our final example so for this example we have a second order um, linear non-homogeneous ordinary differential equation with two non-zero initial conditions. Uh, we know from doing a Laplace transform um, technique on this particular ODE in the Laplace transform videos, this was the uh, result of that as far as the Laplace transform, and this was the corresponding solution. So we're actually going to show that if we employ convolution, uh, that we should get the same thing. Again, since we do not have um, all initial conditions equaling zero, uh, we are going to have to split it up by saying our total solution is basically going to be um, our solution um, using Dudamel's principle where we force all the initial conditions to be zero and we're gonna add that to um, forcing our equation here to be a homogeneous one but do that with the actual initial conditions that we desire so we start off um, again with actual equation but force initial conditions all to be zero um, and if we do laplace transform of both sides of that uh, we see that this is our situation here and if you remember the laplace transform of the second derivative of a function is s squared times big y of s minus s y of zero minus y prime of zero okay and again we can actually see that from this table here the second derivative is exactly what i've stated it to be All right, so from there, um, we see here that we have common term of big Y of S, so we factor that out and divide by S squared plus four on both sides. And we see that big Y of S ends up being two divided by S squared plus four over one, sorry, times uh, one over S squared minus four. And of course, this, comes from the Laplace transform of sine of 2t. Again, if we look at our tables again, you'll see that this actually comes from here where the omega here is assumed to be two. So of course, sine of 2t. So now that we have all that in place, um, of course, we can multiply this together 
but we want to leave it apart because we know that we want to rewrite um, y of s here as x of s times h of s so that we can take the inverse of Laplace transform of these separately. Okay. So if we do that, notice that both of these are sort of a, a when we do the inverse Laplace transform of them, um, since we have a number divided by s squared plus another number, both of these are going to be some form of a sine function. Okay. So whenever we do the inverse Laplace transform for this first one, um, we're going to see, uh, and I just kind of, I'm going to skip to get to this point. We're going to see here that since this and this matches exactly, that's just going to be sine of 2t. Since the one up here doesn't match exactly with uh, what 2 squared would be here, uh, we have to force it to match. So that's why we're multiplying by 1, but we make 1 look like 2 times 1 half. And so in doing that, uh, we make sure that the 1 times the 1 half uh, that goes away and this part is what we actually take the Laplace transform of and the one half times one we just factored that out and then we have sine 2t again and if you remember our properties we said that um, if we have a non-zero uh, constant being multiplied times a function we got to convolve it we can just factor that and put it all on the outside and so by definition uh, if we convolve sine of 2t times itself it's going to end up looking like this and here remember that everywhere where we see um, z here uh, or, or 2t here um, we're going to replace it with t so let me try to say that again <laughs> so basically here uh, whatever this is i'm going to replace it so we got t here so wherever i see T here is going to be with Z for this one, okay? And wherever I see T for this one is going to be T minus Z for that one. So I think I said that right this time. So uh, that's why this will end up looking this way. And notice here that we have two times T minus Z, okay? So uh, make sure that whatever T is here, um, you replace it with t minus z over here so you got to make sure it's two times all of that and of course that means that you're going to distribute that two to both terms and that's very important to remember all right so once we do that then of course uh, we see that we got the situation of we're dealing with the the product of the sine of two functions again so we use this product to sum formula and if you remember um, in the video, I, I had derived how to get the uh, product of some formula for cosine of um, A times cosine of B. Uh, we can do a similar thing for finding sine of alpha times sine of beta. Uh, we see that this is the result. And so uh, from that, of course, if we do the proper substitutions, um, if we let alpha equal to Z, and we're saying that because this is place of alpha here and you see that all of this is in the place of beta here so if we let alpha equal to z beta equal two times in parenthesis two minus z which is two t minus two z then of course we see <clears throat> that as a result um alpha minus beta is going to be four z minus two t and alpha plus beta is just two t so um plug all that information in and now we have the situation where we have the difference of two terms um, remember that z is the variable for the uh, integral so 2t looks like a constant and of course all of this is going to look like a constant so when we take the antiderivative of the first term uh, where antiderivative of cosine is sine and of course here um, I should have a you know one-fourth that's going to come out as a result of that and so you see that here 
cosine of 2t, since again, z is the variable, looks like a constant. So the antiderivative of a constant is just that constant times the variable. And then from there, we just plug in, um, do the net change theorem, plug in uh, t everywhere where we see z, minus plug in zero everywhere where we see z. And so we see uh, this is what happens when we plug in t everywhere where we see z. This is what happens whenever we plug in zero everywhere where we see um, t. And then from there, we do some simplification. Uh, we get to here and then. Of course, at that at this point, um, we see that this term and this term are like terms, so we just combine them together. Uh, we got one sixteenth, one sixteenth, add them together. Two sixteenths is the same as one eighth, and then of course this term kind of stands on its own. So we see that this is going to be our solution from Duhamel's principle. So next. Uh, we figure out what's going to be the solution to the homogene corresponding homogeneous equation where we actually have the actual initial conditions. And for this one, uh, you notice I went ahead and did a Laplace transform for, for it, um, doing it that way. So here, uh, we just take the Laplace transform of both sides. Uh, of course, we already know what the Laplace transform of the second derivative of a function would be. Laplace transform of four times y is just four times big Y of s. And Laplace transform of zero is itself zero. And so uh, then from there, uh, what we would do is just simplify as much as we can. These two terms, we would add to both sides. So that's why we get five plus three s over here. And these two remaining terms, I would factor out the Y of s out of each of them. So that's how we get this. And so now uh, from here, we divide both sides by s squared plus four. And uh, once we have it into this form, we know that we can split it up into two separate um, terms that are added together. And so at this point, since um, we have a situation where we have two terms that are added together, we don't want to use convolution to figure it out, okay? Because to try to factor this, uh, to make it to be a factor times another factor uh, would be way more complex to do um, in terms of what goal we're after versus just using a Laplace transform of it, um, inverse Laplace transform of it looking this way. So we just take the inverse Laplace transform of this term, inverse Laplace transform of the other term, and we finish out. Okay. Now, uh, the note that I have here is again, uh, for this type of equation that we're solving, uh, we could use uh, what we've learned as far as solving uh, second order uh, linear ODEs uh, that have all constant coefficients. Um, all I'm doing here is just stating that if that was the case, we could easily solve this doing it that way, and this would be a case three situation. But again, I'm trying to show as much as I can of uh, convolution with Laplace transform. So I just decided to, to you know, not do it this way and work it the other way. So uh, we take the inverse Laplace transform of both terms here. Um, we see that this two, four is just two squared. And since five doesn't match that exactly, I'll pull the five out and I'll force this to be one by taking it with a number that does match. And then the result here, I have to factor that out as well. And then, of course, all of this is just going to be sine of 2t. We do similar sort of thing here. Um, we take the 3 out, and we know whenever we have s in the numerator here, um, the inverse Laplace transform of this particular expression here is just going to be cosine of whatever that number is, t. And so we see we get... Uh, 3 cosine t and then of course the sum of these two solutions here would actually be what the y sub hi solution is and so finally we just add the two solutions that we had together so if you remember we had this solution to start off with for the y sub d and then of course we got this solution 
for the y sub h i, and we just add them all together. Um, combine like terms as needed, and we see that we end up getting the same thing that we got uh, whenever we did it purely to Laplace transform way. Okay. And so hopefully these examples here will give you an idea of um, how we actually use convolution uh, to be able to help us out to, to make the process of um, solving these ordinary differential equations easier. Um, sometimes uh, there are some other problems that I didn't do here to where if we would actually use convolution, it would actually make the problem more difficult. So just know that convolution is a tool to use when it is convenient um, to, to make things go a little bit more smoothly, okay? Now, of course, if you're uh, taking an exam for a course or something like that, they say, hey, do this problem by convolution, then you wanna do that, okay? But in practice, if you're you know, doing this for, let's say, research or whatever, and you're like, hey, I need, I just need to find the quickest way to be able to solve this ordinary differential equation, um, if convolution works, great. Um, you know, if some of the other techniques that you've learned uh, works faster for you, then you need to do that, okay? All right, so this concludes uh, the video series on convolution um, and using it with Laplace transform. I hope this has helped. Take care.